Hello everyone, I hope you all have been doing well. I wanted to switch it up today and focus on a serial killer for this video. I had personally never heard of this case before digging a bit, but I found the whole thing pretty interesting, and I hope you do too. Today's case takes place in the late 1970s and early 1980s. This was a time before there was any sort of national database for authorities to use to help connect cases together. It wouldn't be until 1985 when VICAP, or the Violent Criminal Apprehension Program, was created by the FBI. And it wouldn't be until even later, in 1990, when CODIS, the Combined DNA Index System, would be constructed. Not having a system in place made it extremely difficult for investigators to track dangerous individuals who moved around the country. During the time of the case, there was a string of murders near Fairbanks, Alaska. As police worked to find the killer, the murders halted completely. Because of this, authorities believed that whoever was committing the killings probably died, got caught for something else, or moved away. With no database available, it was very hard for investigators to track who could have killed the victims after they left Alaska. It wouldn't be too long until they finally figured out who was responsible, though. Due to non-stop dedication to the case, police finally were able to pin down a suspect for the murders, even though he was now living over 4,000 miles away. Let's dive into the series of events that makes this story so interesting. The case centers around a small town just southeast of Fairbanks, called North Pole, Alaska. Just under 1,700 miles south from the real geographical North Pole sits the quaint and charming town. As the name suggests, this town is known for its year-round Christmas spirit. According to Population.us, the town's population was only 724 in 1980, so it truly was tiny. Most of North Pole's street names are Christmas-themed, and you will always be able to find Christmas items sold year-round. This town is probably the last place you'd expect something sinister to happen, but, as we'll soon learn, that was unfortunately not the case. Just over 10 minutes southeast sits the Eielson Air Force Base. This location becomes important later on in the case, so just keep that in mind. Now, after a quick explanation of the area, let's jump into the case. On August 29, 1979, an airman named Jerry Soderman arrived home to find his newlywed wife, 19-year-old Glinda Soderman, missing. Their newborn daughter was found safe and sound in her crib, but his wife was nowhere to be seen. By all accounts, Glinda was happy with her life and had absolutely no reason as to why she would run away. Her family was stumped, as no foul play was immediately evident. Her father, who was a state trooper, insisted that Glinda would never have run away. This claim of his was later proven to be right. A few months went by, and on a chilly October day in the nearby town of Moose Creek, hunters stumbled upon the decomposing body of Glinda Sodeman in a remote area. When troopers arrived at the scene, they concluded that Glinda had been killed by a gunshot wound to the face. Not only did she have an obvious wound, but the troopers found a bullet casing near her body. There was also evidence to suggest Glinda had been strangled sometime during her attack. Her body was found fully clothed, and there was no evidence of sexual assault. Police interviewed Glinda's husband, Jerry, and had him undergo a polygraph test, which he failed. Suspicion against him quickly arose, but there was no physical evidence found. Therefore, they had no reason to arrest him. Glinda's death would be the first of many murders to take place in a short period of time in the surrounding areas. About a year later, on June 11, 1980, an 11-year-old girl named Doris Ehring was riding her bike along with her older brother through the streets of North Pole. Doris sped ahead of her brother, and he lost sight of her for just a moment. When he finally caught up, he noticed Doris talking to a strange man with a blue car. The man had the hood propped open, as if he was having car trouble of some sort. He also noticed that the man had a mustache and was wearing what appeared to be an Air Force uniform of some kind. Doris's brother pulled up to where she was standing, and the man subsequently slammed the hood, 
jumped into the car and peeled away from the two kids. I guess they thought nothing of it and went on their way playing together once again. That was until two days passed. On June 13, 1980, Doris disappeared altogether. Her bicycle was later found stashed in some bushes along Badger Road, which wasn't too far from where she lived in North Pole. After this discovery, a witness came forward to report that they saw a blue car tearing around the corner at an intersection not far from where Doris's bike was found on the day of her disappearance. According to this witness, the driver seemed to be wrestling with someone or something in the seat next to him as he drove by. Other witnesses report a man they saw around the same time with a military-style haircut. Police began to put together a timeline of what they believed happened. They theorized that whoever had taken Doris was hiding in the bushes along Badger Road and jumped out to grab Doris as she rode past on her bike. He then threw her bike in the bushes in an attempt to conceal it before rushing to his vehicle to flee the scene. Considering Doris's brother thought the strange man's clothing looked like an Air Force uniform, and the other witnesses saying they saw a man with a haircut similar to one someone would have in the military, police decided to request a list of blue cars, which were registered to drive on the nearby Eielson Air Force Base. It was the only starting point they had, as there was no physical evidence left behind. The Air Force came back to the authorities with a list of 550 names. Each one was someone who had a vehicle registered to the base which may have fit the description. Police did the best that they could, but with no further evidence such as DNA or fingerprints left behind, there wasn't much they could do at this point. Narrowing down the list would be extremely hard with nothing else to go off of. Jerry Sodeman was still being looked at in connection to his young wife's murder. So according to an article from Medium.com, the police decided to question him about Doris's disappearance as well. Another polygraph was administered, but this time the results came back as inconclusive. Though they had no physical evidence linking Jerry to either crime, police found it very strange that he was unable to pass a polygraph in either of these cases. Also, many sources state that Jerry was an airman. I tried to figure out where he was working, but unfortunately, no source stated that. I'm thinking he might have been working at the nearby Eielson Air Force Base, which may have drawn the investigators to him further, but I'm not fully sure of that, so keep that in mind. Either way, According to Medium.com, in order to nail down an explanation as to why he may have been failing the tests, police had a polygraph expert come in to evaluate the results further. Within 10 minutes, the expert concluded that Jerry had an irregular heartbeat, which would never produce a passing result. No matter if he was lying or telling the truth, the results would always come out as inconclusive or failing. Jerry was finally dismissed as a suspect, at least in the disappearance of Doris as the police had no other evidence to go off of. After this, I did not read anything that suggested Jerry continued to be a suspect in his wife's murder, but I'm not exactly sure when he was cleared of suspicion. A little over seven months later, in January of 1981, a 20-year-old woman named Marlene Peters went missing. According to an article on Medium.com, Marlene was last seen attempting to hitch a ride up to Anchorage to see her sick father. There was no way for police to know exactly where Marlene disappeared from. She could have disappeared anywhere between Fairbanks and Anchorage, which is a drive of over six hours. Despite investigations being held, nothing further was discovered about Marlene's disappearance. It was only five months later, in March, when Wendy Wilson, who was only 16 years old, vanished. Like Marlene, Wendy was last known to be hitchhiking. However, this time, a witness came forward claiming they saw her getting into a white pickup truck in Moose Creek, the same town that Glinda Sodeman's remains were found in. Unlike Glinda and Marlene, however, Wendy's body didn't stay hidden for too long. Only three days after she went missing, her body was found 32 miles south of Fairbanks, near Johnson Road. This road is on the southern side of the Eielson Air Force Base. After examining her body, it was determined that like Glinda, Wendy was strangled and shot in the face. Nine weeks after the discovery of Wendy's body, in May of 1981, Marlene's remains were finally located by two fishermen. Hers were found in the same general area, only two miles away from where Wendy was found. Marlene had met the exact same fate as Wendy and Glinda, as she was strangled before being shot in the face. Only two days after Marlene's body was located, police were made aware of a fifth disappearance. Last seen walking in Fairbanks, 
19-year-old Lori King, vanished. By this time, it was pretty clear that there was a serial kidnapper and killer operating in and around North Pole, Alaska. Police, along with volunteers from the local towns and military volunteers from the nearby base, all got together to search for missing Doris and Lori's bodies. They began the search for them in the area where the two previous victims were found. Unfortunately, nothing came of the search, leaving everyone even more confused as to where their bodies may have been dumped. Fortunately, on September 2, 1981, Lori's body was discovered. It had indeed been in the same general area as the other two victims, near Johnson Road, but searchers had somehow missed this area during the initial search. She was found in a wooded area, which actually fell on a federal reservation. Lori was sadly found in the exact same fashion as the previous victims, strangled and shot in the face. The fact that multiple bodies were showing up near the Air Force base made police even more confident that the killer could be part of the military. Doris, however, was still not found. At this point, it was beyond clear to investigators that there was a serial killer at work here. The cases were happening too close together and were too similar to be a coincidence, let alone that the majority of the bodies were showing up in the same area. Unable to predict what this killer would do next, police decided to stake his dumping grounds in hopes to catch him in the act. To their utter surprise, the killing suddenly stopped altogether. At this point, authorities were panicking. There were bodies popping up all over with absolutely no physical evidence to go off of. Because Lori's location was found on a federal reservation, the FBI swiftly joined in on the case, lending their resources to find the killer. A task force was formed, which consisted of FBI agents, Alaska State Troopers, the Fairbanks Police Department, the North Pole City Police Department, people from the Eielson Air Force Office of Special Investigations, as well as the Army's Criminal Investigation Division from the nearby Fort Wainwright. According to Oxygen.com, the FBI came up with a potential profile for the killer. They predicted the killer to be a white male between 18 and 35 years old, likely single with no children and with no steady job. This profile excluded the idea of the killer being part of the military, which threw off their original theory that the killer may be part of the Air Force. Despite this profile, authorities still considered the possibility that the killer could have been serving on the Eielson Air Force Base and continued to look into this lead while also opening their minds to other possibilities. I read on a few sources that this case was one of the first to use profiling as a method of investigation, at least successfully. This wasn't reported everywhere, but I read it enough for it to seem likely. Lori King's murder in May of 1981 would be the last. Because of this, the task force concluded that either the killer was incarcerated, had moved away, or had died themselves. At some point, the Alaskan authorities sent out warnings to the other U.S. states, asking them to watch out for similar murders in their areas, just in case the killer had left the area. Like stated at the beginning of the video, there was no national database in place at the time, so getting information over to and back from other states was no simple task. According to MilitaryJusticeForAll.com in November of 1982, the Alaskan troopers got a call from Henrietta, Texas, informing them of a woman who was found murdered under very similar circumstances. Her name was Cassandra Goodwin. She had also been abducted, strangled, and shot. Investigators requested another list from the Eielson Air Force Base, this time seeking any personnel which had transferred out of the base recently. After receiving the list, authorities worked to compare the names given to those who drove either a blue car or a white truck, as both vehicles were spotted in connection to the disappearances. They were also interested to find out if any airmen in particular exhibited a distaste with women, considering the fact that all of the victims were female. Eventually, investigators narrowed the list of potential suspects from the base to three names. Two of the three men were immediately cooperative with police, ready to aid the investigation in any way possible. The third man, however, was anything but cooperative. This man was named Thomas Richard Bunday. Contrary to the profile that was created, Bunday was married and had two kids. Though he met barely any of the specifics of the profile, Bunday did indeed drive a blue car, one very similar to the man's that Doris's brother saw two days before her disappearance. He was also already on the Air Force's radar after several complaints came in about his inappropriate behavior towards women. 
He had apparently been making inappropriate and sexual remarks to the women he worked with on the base. Police compiled photos of all of the airmen who had moved away and showed the collection to Doris's brother. After reviewing them, he chose Bundy's picture without hesitation. Sergeant Samuel Bernard of the Alaska State Troopers stated, quote, We thought he might have been the murderer, but we didn't have physical evidence, so we needed a confession. Before I get too far ahead, I want to back up and talk about Thomas Richard Bunday for a moment. Bunday was born in Nashville, Tennessee, on September 28, 1948. His childhood was not ideal, as his father, who was a World War II veteran, was very abusive towards his wife and three children, including Bunday. His father unfortunately suffered from mental disorders, potentially stemming from his service, but I was unable to narrow it down exactly. When his father died in 1963, Bundy absolutely refused to go to his funeral. Instead, he ran away from home for several days. Apparently, in his childhood, Bundy was a decently good student, who had a fair amount of friends. He was by no means popular among children his age, though. Little more is known about his life as a child or teenager, but he went on to graduate high school in 1966. Almost immediately after graduating, Bundy married his high school sweetheart and joined the United States Air Force the following year. During the late 1960s into the early 1970s, Bunday was stationed in Southeast Asia. While he was stationed out of the US, Bunday's wife became pregnant and gave birth to a son who was fathered by another man. Despite this infidelity, Bunday and his wife stayed together and continued their relationship. Bunday took in the baby boy and raised him as his own. The couple then went on to have a daughter together and the now family of four moved to Alaska when Bundy was transferred to Eielson Air Force Base. It was after this move that Bundy began to exhibit signs of emotional burnout. He also started to see a psychotherapist around this time. Unfortunately, it seems that the damage was done at this point, and nothing could stop him from going on to do what he did. Many also believe that the baby that his wife had with another man put a massive strain on their relationship which ultimately caused a rift between them. And I will say, this is a pretty fair assumption. Nothing that I read definitively proved this, but like I said, it's really not far-fetched to imagine this being the case. At the time of the case's events, Bundy had served 15 years in the military. After talking a bit about Bundy's life prior to the events of this case, let's jump forward in time again. At this point in the case, Bundy had left Alaska with his family, and was now living in Wichita Falls, Texas. This was a mere 20-minute drive from Henrietta, where Cassandra Goodwin was found murdered in a similar way to those killed in Alaska. Bundy had transferred from the Eielson Air Force Base to Shepard Air Force Base shortly after the fifth murder in Alaska occurred. In March of 1983, Alaskan authorities made a trip down to Texas to speak with Bundy themselves. According to MilitaryJusticeForAll.com, the interrogation lasted at least a week, consisting of several meetings. Each meeting was said to be three hours long, and during them, the investigators would continually ask about the murders. Bundy would not deny or confess to the murders, however, no matter how much the authorities pried. In addition to their interrogations, authorities also performed a search on Bundy's home and car. They were able to find evidence which linked him to the murders in Fairbanks. In his home, Investigators recovered bullets which were tied to the ones found with the victims. In the trunk of his car, hairs were collected and were confirmed to be those of Wendy Wilson's, the fourth victim. As far as I could find, investigators never found the murder weapon. According to Oxygen.com on day four of their questioning, Bundy handed one of the investigators a note which read, quote, I really liked you guys, and I've enjoyed talking with you, but I didn't do these things. He then left the station and went back home. The next morning, investigators told Bundy about what they found on his property. Upon being informed of this, Bundy went on to finally confess to all five murders which took place in Alaska. He described how each murder occurred. He stated that he was suffering with psychological problems as well as sexual complexes, which ultimately led to the horrific murders. However, despite his confession to the murders in Alaska, Bundy would not claim responsibility for the similar murder of Cassandra Goodwin which took place in Texas. This is where the story takes an unexpected turn. Apparently, despite his clear confessions of not one, two, 
three or four but five murders, Bundy had to be set free. This was due to the fact that there was no arrest warrant active on him from Alaska. The Alaskan investigators had no authority to arrest him in Texas because of this, so he went on his merry way. I'm not sure why exactly they didn't secure an arrest warrant before confronting him with the evidence they found, but nevertheless, they then scrambled to obtain the arrest warrant from Alaska. The whole situation is very strange to me. I don't understand why he would be allowed to leave after literally confessing to killing five people. But nevertheless, he was able to. It just seems super risky for rules like that to be in place, as we will soon discover. Finally, they secured the warrant for Bunday, but before they could get him back into custody, the unthinkable happened. On March 15, 1983, police went to his home to take him into custody, when Bunday's wife informed them that he had left on his motorcycle a little over an hour prior. The police learned shortly after this that now 34-year-old Thomas Richard Bunday purposely drove his motorcycle into oncoming traffic, slamming into a truck about 40 miles east of Wichita Falls, Texas. Not surprisingly, he died instantly on impact. His death severely hampered the investigation. As I'm sure you can imagine, authorities had many questions surrounding the five murders he confessed to. And if you'll remember, I never talked about investigators finding 11-year-old Doris Ehring's body. That's because they hadn't, and the location of her body was a mystery that authorities were hoping to solve by speaking with Bunday. Just a quick note, there was one source which stated he disclosed her general location during his confessions, but the majority of articles did not mention this, so I was unable to verify this information. After his death, investigators went to his home to speak with his wife. When asked about how their marriage was, she reportedly remarked that it was not in good standing. According to his wife, she suspected that he had been fantasizing about other women in some way. She told the detectives that one day, when Bunday was out of the house, she went looking through his drawers to see if she could find anything. That's when she came upon a manila envelope, which contained several pictures of women and girls in bikinis, or otherwise partially unclothed. This finding suggested that he got some sort of gratification out of looking at and taking pictures of girls in various forms of undress, which confirmed his wife's suspicions. She subsequently took the envelope and threw it in their fire pit, destroying all of the photos. Other than this, I'm not sure what the investigators got out of their discussion with Bunday's wife, but him having those photos sure is interesting. The investigation continued, with authorities still looking for 11-year-old Doris's remains. I am happy to report that Doris's family did end up getting closure for her disappearance. In August of 1986, over three years after Bundy committed suicide, Doris's skull was found in a secluded part of the Eielson Air Force Base, where Bundy used to work. Like the other victims, police found a bullet hole in the skull. Bundy's position on the base likely allowed him to view his dump sites via surveillance camera. Authorities believe that he may have gone so far as to remotely watch as searchers combed the surrounding areas, looking for the discarded remains of his victims. This could also explain why the killings stopped shortly after the police started to find the bodies. Maybe Bunday got spooked if he was able to watch as authorities combed the area. It's possible that he took this as his cue to leave, hoping they wouldn't be able to connect the murders to him if he moved far away. It's sick to think that Bunday may have been watching as police dug each body up. If he was able to see the areas, he was most likely looking at them again and again to relive his crimes over and over. To this day, Bunday is known to be responsible for all five murders which took place in Alaska, but many believe he also killed Cassandra Goodwin. A popular theory is that he did not confess to her murder because he would have definitely been arrested, since it took place in Texas. He must have known he wouldn't have a chance to end his life on his own terms if he did confess to her murder. I think there is a very good chance that Bunday was responsible for Cassandra's murder. I'd like to know your thoughts on this, though I'm sure most of you would probably agree. Now, I want to share a bit about each victim. Unfortunately, digging up any personal information on any of his victims seemed impossible, and for some I wasn't able to find anything at all. They still deserve to have their own part of the video, so I will list the very limited information I could find. Glinda Armstrong Sodeman was only 19 years old at the time of her death. She was married to a man named Jerry, 
and together, they had a newborn baby. She had just started a new chapter of her life, which was sadly torn away from her. Doris Ehring was born on August 16, 1968. When she died, Doris was only 11 years old. With her family, she lived in the quaint town of North Pole, Alaska. 20-year-old Marlene Jean Peters was born on March 3, 1960. She lived in Tanana, Alaska with her family. I read in a news article that she had three brothers and five sisters. Wendy Wilson was only 16 years old when she was murdered. I read that she was attending Eielson High School at the time of her death, but I only saw that in one really old news article. Unfortunately, other than that, I found no information on Wendy. Lori Scott King was born on February 12, 1963. She was only 18 years old when she was killed. This was literally the only thing I could find about her. Even though it is not confirmed for certain that Bundy was responsible for killing Cassandra Goodwin, I think she deserves to be remembered as well. All of these young girls and women had so much of their lives ahead of them. I'm sure each and every one of them had goals and aspirations for the future. For no reason, an evil man decided to take that away from them. They were all young, and thus they each were a more vulnerable target. Bundy knew this, and took advantage of it. Please take a moment to remember these six victims today. Instead of owning up to his wicked actions, Bundy decided he would take the coward's way out and avoid taking any responsibility in the death of five, potentially six people. Even though he ended his own life and never got time for his crimes, I hope that the families of the victims were able to get closure from at least knowing who was responsible for their loved one's deaths. I feel so terrible for the families of each of his victims. Please give each one of them a moment of remembrance. I wish I was able to dig up more on the victims as well. It's incredibly sad to me that little is known about them. If you happen to know any more details regarding any of the victims, please feel free to share it, even though it's unlikely. Thank you so much for sticking to the end of this video. I hope you enjoyed it and found it interesting. I'd like to know your thoughts regarding this case, especially surrounding the fact that Bundy was able to get away and kill himself before facing justice. I hope you all have a great night, and I'll see you with another case, hopefully sometime soon.